I'm Janice Fiemengo of the University of Ottawa. My theme today is microaggression. This is the last in my five-part series on key feminist terms from academia that have gone mainstream with pernicious effect on honest dialogue about equality. In the latter half of the series, we've been looking at terms that are particularly invulnerable to reasoned attack. Privilege, because it is by nature invisible, according to the experts, and structural violence, because it redefines inequality as violence, claiming that if one woman can be shown to suffer violence or inequality, then all women are a victim class. Now for our fifth term the one that most obviously signals the irrational obsession with victimization of feminists and other SJWs. The final term, microaggression, has become the ultimate symbol of manufactured outrage. The term microaggression was first coined in 1970 by Harvard University professor Chester Pierce, according to Daryl Wing Su's book, Microaggressions in Everyday Life, published in 2010. And it has been widely taken up by psychologists to describe the everyday, normalized, verbal and nonverbal slights or insulting behaviors whereby members of dominant groups communicate, consciously or unconsciously, derogatory messages to members of marginalized groups. Quite recently, the term has been adopted by journalists and university students, enabling all variety of the walking wounded to describe the subtle ways in which their society makes them other. There's an online microaggression blog that contains many examples of these daily slights, the use of the word illegals for one example, any expression of objection to gay marriage, relatives asking a lesbian who's home from college whether she met any nice boys there, a teacher asking a black student, quote, don't you think your reaction was offensive as well, a t-shirt that says, Cool story, babe. Now make me a sandwich. Microaggression. Actually, it's a clever term in its paradoxical insistence on the hurtful significance of the admittedly trivial. In that way, microaggression is a potentially apt descriptor for how human beings continue in a multitude of ways to hurt and disgust and outrage one another, even in a society as relatively peaceful and civil as our own. The term might be appropriately applied in many spheres. How about to the manner in which women put one another down all the time with seemingly nice comments, such as, that extra weight looks really good on you. I'll bet there's not a woman around who doesn't know what I'm talking about. And if you're looking for one of the most disabling of microaggressions, the use of the term privilege to describe the positions earned by brilliant and hardworking white men is a fantastic example of the ultimate put down. But the term is never used to describe what two white women might say to one another or what women say about men. It's only used to describe aggression by the so-called privileged against the so-called oppressed. So a t-shirt that says, make me a sandwich, is a misogynistic microaggression, whereas a feminist professor's use of the phrase toxic masculinity in her lectures is not. Personally, I'd rather deal with a joke t-shirt than an established theory supported by my professor and accepted by elite society generally that says my sex has a genetic disposition to violence and domination. This is the ultimate hypocrisy of microaggression. It claims to be about preventing subtle sexual, racial, and other forms of discrimination, but its insistence that only certain groups of people can be affected, exposes it for the blatant power play that it is. Like the terms lived experience, privilege, and structural violence, the theory of microaggression affirms that certain perceptions and experiences, those of women and other marginalized groups, should always be given priority in interpreting the world, while the perceptions and experiences of white men can be explained away or simply ignored. 
Would any reasonable person claim that being expected to bring the coffee and donuts to a meeting because you're a woman, if that really happens very often at all, is equivalent in any way to being told, not by a few individuals whom you can correct or ignore, but by every person in authority at your university and at every university in North America and by every established media outlet and news organization, that because you're male, you need to be taught not to rape. Would any reasonable person claim that a donut expectation is a more hurtful and serious problem in our society than a rape expectation? Would any reasonable person really claim that a female scientist being mistaken for her academic colleague's secretary, if that really happens very often at all, is equivalent in any way to being told not by a few individuals whom you can correct or ignore, but by the Institute for the Prevention and Treatment of Mascopathy that being male is a disease? Sounds dramatic, doesn't it? But it's true. There is an organization called the Institute for the Prevention and Treatment of Mascopathy, headed up by a team of credentialed individuals, as far as I can tell. I don't think it's a joke. With an advisory board made up of doctors, psychotherapists, psychologists, and counselors, and even a Christian pastor. The Institute claims that mascopathy is a pathology of masculinity that, quote, erodes a balanced and healthy humanity, end quote. The first sentence of the Institute's website states its worldview, quote, men often behave badly, end quote, due to masculinity, as it goes on to say. Well, thank God women are not diseased in their humanity. And that's the whole point, isn't it? This movement of which microaggression theory is one strategy is about making the hatred of men respectable. A team of counselors, doctors, psychiatrists, and health researchers would never put their formal support behind an institute claiming that women who behave badly suffer from femopathy, a genetic-based disease of femininity, though such a theory would have at least as much credibility as mascopathy does. Anyone suggesting that women's humanity had been eroded by their narcissism, pettiness, and irrationality would probably be drummed out of their positions. But many powerful thought leaders in our society, men included, believe that men need to be, quote, reinvented, as the website claims. Microaggression? Ah, not nearly as bad as having your boss refer to you by your first name because you're female. Like privilege, microaggression is a term that has, in its very definition, a built-in immunity from a reason-based rebuttal. The blog Geek Feminism provides the following explanation for why microaggression is hard to define and defend, and why white males and other privileged types, therefore, shouldn't question it. This is what they say. It's, quote, difficult for oppressed people to explain the significance of microaggressions because it's difficult to convey their relative frequency compared to the experiences of privileged people and easy for privileged people to come up with plausible alternative explanations for any one microaggression. And here's the example they give. Quote, well, there's an Angela Smith and a Jane Smith, so obviously it makes sense to call you Angela and Jane rather than Smith. Yeah, that would be a plausible explanation for the so-called sexist microaggression of referring to Angela and Jane by their first names. But that's too easy. It doesn't validate the paranoia of Angela or Jane. So don't bother offering rebuttals to even the most obviously false evidence of discrimination. It will merely prove that you're a privileged oppressor who has not done the morally necessary work of imagining the debilitating consequence of being called by your first name. Shame on you. We are in the realm of what? 
a deep irrationality, an illness of the mind, a culture-wide suspension of reasoning powers, a public readiness to reorder society, to punish perpetrators and compensate victims for entirely imaginary acts of intimidation and psychological violence. If you think the effects of microaggression theory are confined to the fevered imagination of a few activists with way too much time on their hands, or even to the insular conference gatherings of a few highly paid academics, it's sadly not the case. A few years ago, for example, a group of graduate students in Education and Information Studies at the University of California at Los Angeles staged a sit-in to, quote, educate their professor and other students about the racial discrimination they claim to have experienced in the course. At the sit-in, they presented a list of racial microaggressions, one of which, in a perfect illustration of the self-confirming logic of microaggression victimology, involved a black male PhD student whose research focuses on, wait for it, black male experiences of microaggression, who claimed that comments made by his white peers about his microaggression research being too subjective were in themselves forms of microaggression. This is Alice in Wonderland, isn't it? But instead of reprimanding the students for disrupting class, the dean of graduate school responded by declaring himself humbly dedicated, yeah, he actually word that, used that word, humbly, to listening and learning from this experience. He claimed that, quote, together we will heal. So the students' risible complaints were validated, as has continued to happen at prestigious universities all across North America. Words fail to adequately represent the ludicrousness of this cultural moment, the cringe-making eagerness with which seemingly intelligent people prostrate themselves to learn humbly from our era's priests and priestesses of the false god of moral outrage. We dare not question, we dare not disagree, and we probably doubt ourselves. I said in a previous video that I was going to offer my thoughts on resisting feminist propaganda terms, but the more I thought about it all, the more dubious I became. Can a culture-wide pathology be strategically resisted? I was going to remind you of the old adage, where reason fails to convince, there is nothing left but ridicule. I had planned to say that we need to laugh these words right out of existence, mock them, deride them, puncture their carapace of righteousness, make faces, snort with derision, call them out for their corrosive silliness. I'm still going to do that, but I'm not confident. The feminist narrative is not going away anytime soon. I think we will see more nonsense, more men forced to apologize for nothing, more men hounded out of their positions, more restrictions on free expression in the name of protecting feelings. Why? Because it's a good gig for a lot of women and other professional victims. The people whose sickness it is to believe themselves the victims of white men, they don't want to get better. Their sickness feels good and it brings them attention and sympathy and an identity and a self-justifying narrative that most of them are never going to give up of their own accord. We can laugh all we want, and I certainly will, but I fear it won't make enough of a difference. But it might. So I'll keep on, on that slim chance, and I hope you will too, if for no other reason than to stave off madness oneself. My husband says, irony is good for you. It's got iron in it.